yeah is okay okay did you see yeah thank okay. you very much for this nice uh, presentation well uh, i uh, we as we as we said at the beginning of the session we are going to have the question and answer uh, at, at the end of the presentations so okay we, yeah i i suggest we follow up uh, and uh, and uh, give the floor to Henning Hansen for his presentation on um, um, umbilical based small surface footprint subsurface drilling technology and method. Thank you. Sure. Hi, this is Henning Hansen. Can you see my presentation? Yeah, everything is good. Okay, good. Let's see. Okay, so uh, my name is Henning Hansen. I'm representing a company in Norway called Arbach Innovation. Uh, we are an engineering and innovation company involved in, uh, in the oil industry and also other industries. Uh, and I'm going to talk about a project we started some years ago uh, called the Umbrella Drill. And the, uh, the target there was to develop a system that will drill with an umbilical instead of jointed drill pipes. That, that was the target there. Huh? So I'm going to go to the next slide there. Okay, so here you see some of the things that I've worked on that makes it actually uh, possible for me to come up with this and, and uh, we have the technologies and, and, and to do this. So I have quite a few patents in the oil industry. I've also been involved in building up companies uh, and also in oil bike innovation. We have close to 25 engineers that's very experienced now in, in in uh, complex um, wellbore equipment and so on. And um, I've been, uh, you, to the right there, you see a composite rod I invented and uh, developed some years ago, which is pushed into long wellbores and doing uh, fiber optic logging. And down to the left there, you see something called robotic drilling system. That was actually a robotics uh, that we developed for, for drilling and so on. So we have some, some background in that one. Huh? So what we propose now is actually that the, the project we call Embelly Drill, that was revitalized that one and I'm inviting anybody online today actually because we need to find partners in, er in Europe that has uh, competencies and also technologies to make this happen. Huh? So basically what this is going to be is going to be an electrical drilling machine system uh, which is operated by a spooled cable or umbilical uh, from the surface. Uh, we want to have very long reach and uh, because we will have several uh, a number of umbilicals which is spliced between by a locomotive drive systems between them. We shall be able to go and do sharp deviations and that will enable us to do underground loops or uh, like a you know, heat loop and um, also have the drilling of fluid in and fluid out of well in the safer operation in the umbilical. Huh? So the purpose here is actually to re remove the need for fracking and as you know actually if you remove the need for fracking and you have much better flow through a reservoir, so then you don't need to have the, the high uh, energy pumps for pumping in fluids and pumping around again, which takes a lot of your electrical power that you actually produce from this. Huh? Um, the um, composite umbilical will be strong enough to pull the machine back out of the wellbore and also will have tractoring capabilities. It will move up and down. And we have high flow rate uh, circulation because we have pumps at different uh, uh, sections of the umbilical on the locomotive sections. So thereby we can cool the entire uh, uh, underground drilling systems. Huh? In recent years, there has been composites emerging that makes it feas feasible to build an umbilical that handles samples up to 200 degrees Celsius. Huh? Uh, we will use fiber optics in this one also. So then it's, it gets possible to do high temperatures. Um, we are manufacturing well electrical wellbore heating systems delivering 500 degrees Celsius downhole now. And that is also new since we started this project some years ago and, and, and temporarily parked it. And uh, that, that, that is also deployed by an umbilical. So we have a lot of in-house high temperature experience now in the company, which makes me believe that we can do this. Huh? Here you see a simplified uh, schematic actually on, on the bottom there you see how a drilling assembly will, will look like. We are not going to uh, develop like the, the, the directional drilling uh, equipment or the drill bit and so on and the motors and so on, but we will adapt them to be electrical operated and uh, we will connect it to an umbilical. Yeah. Of course we will have some, some tractoring mechanism or strokers and so on in this one. 
But what you see up, up on uh, the left hand side there is a simplified sketch actually what happens if you have um, a bellicle in, uh, in a borehole on the ground and there's some, some angles on that one is that you will get friction um, around those and that limits the possibility go, to go far and also definitely li limits the possibilities when you're going to pull out. The way to avoid that problem is to have short or umbilical lengths and you have locomotives or tractoring units a bit, uh, at spaced out intervals so there you can push and pull uh, depending on what you need to do on your umbilical so you see a simplified um, uh, there's a 3d drawing of one of the um, locomotives there so imagine you have eight or ten of those together to get enough strength up, huh? and to the left there you see a concept for the umbilical it has um, a flow loops actually back and forth where we can transport curtains and cool and we will also have electrical power and also fiber optic in it and so on. So we'll have real-time data from everything going on down there. We can accurately know the weight on bit, etc. And we can set the anchors and, and run the locomotives to get the, the optimum uh, penetration rate down. And also we have, of course, we have this really temperature and acoustics uh, 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 along the entire umbilical. That would tell us a lot what was going on there. Huh? Uh, kick detection is not that relevant here, but it's uh, it's it's possible to do that, huh? And uh, yeah, so rest I've also talked about. Actually, we have pumps and so on in it, so we that reduces the flowing pressures on this one. Huh? Um, so this is just simplified sketch. <coughs> sorry, of how it could be done. For instance, we can go, we can drill an entry borehole, and we can do it also when and at the deviation, for instance. And then we can drill the underground loop and come up again to surface instead of having several wells. So this is a well boy. We have large um, reservoir contact. We can also do something fa more fancy, for instance, we believe actually where we have an entry going around and doing the loops and then back in, and then ending up, with a, ending up with an exit close to the entry um, part of the well boy. Thereby, you reduce the surface uh, facility needs uh, greatly on this one. Huh? Um, and also, we avoid fracking of this one. And um, also, I should say, actually, we have greatly reduced energy required to, to circulate the cold water to hot out, uh, water outlets. And that's because we have uh, the pumps. Uh, that we, you don't need to have pumps downhole for doing this one. Huh? Oh. And the surface footprint, of course. Huh? Yeah. So here's something we we developed and so on. We developed a, a tractor unit actually where we 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 built a prototype and so on, and we did a lot of testing of that one to see how how strong is it, how flexible is it, and how accurately can we can we run it and so on. So and it and it worked functioned very well. We were very satisfied with the system, and we saw that actually at, at separate or different parts of the embellical we could have X number of. Of these tractor units just to tan them together to get whatever force we needed there. Huh? Um, so here's actually the the surface equipment actually this uh, we were thinking about actually having an, uh, an injector on in this one actually the, this is one that's uh, that was designed or the concept that's designed for oil well drilling and so on but actually on um, the geothermal you don't need dual injectors or dual sealing and so on but it will be an internal injector on that one this system here, we can also place at an angle, you know, so you can you can have the entry borehole going at an angle, very much like um, uh, Jansha uh, described there on it. Huh? And what we also did, actually, we, we tried what we called uh, printing casing while drilling, uh, because we saw that actually, well, we, we can easily make a system that can drill through a pretty good rock and so on, a hard formation. But if we hit some loose sand or uh, rock uh, or uh, gravel and so on, we would need to have some uh, some casing in the well bore. And of course, we can pull casing sections in the well bore. We can pull out and then we can pull them in, in and also bring them with the system in there while we're drilling. Uh, but we also wanted to try, can we create the casing while we're drilling there? And as you see on the photos there, we did. We, uh, we did some testing of that one. And uh, we managed to, to print that. We also did a lot of compression tests on it and so on. And so that is something that can be implemented. If we do that one, we would have also uh, conduits in the umbilicals for pumping down the, the um, uh, uh, what we need here to print these um, uh, devices. Here. Hmm? Yeah. So here's uh, just a, 
a little animation we made actually because we saw actually there's also other opportunities for this, for this one but you will you will see from this same animation actually this is showing actually a umbilical or actually a flow line on, on the water where we run this into that for doing servers and so on but it will it will it will look the same in the well bar actually where you see uh, the systems there with a, a number of tractors or, or locomotives pulling an umbilical into the in, into a well bar at an angle and so on hmm? So we call that uh, pipe rhino, that one, because it was done for a rhino. So here you see uh, the same thing again. You can have a number of those uh, coupled together, and then we get all the push and pull we need uh, on, on this equipment. Huh? Yeah. So, so that is the concept I wanted to share with you today. And uh, that ends my presentation. I hope I was about the time there, but uh, it's, it's a project we really want to start up again. And now we see there's a lot of support in the EU and also in the US. I'm, I'm in the US right now, it's three in the morning here, that's fine. But um, we see there's a lot of uh, interest for geothermal uh, drilling and equipment. And it's really a project that we would like to, to bring up, up again because now we have we have the, the capacity to do it and so on. Huh? Earlier when we did this, we had problems getting uh, funding and also we, we had other uh, products that took preference, actually commercial products. Yeah. So that ends my presentation. So I guess uh, the question is the end of the session. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Henning, for this interesting project and which really brings up another another view of how to drill and how to get how to done do the hole. And I I I wish you uh, great success to achieve that and achieve that that particular loop. Uh, which you have uh, sketched on your one of your slides. Yeah, well, we will, as I said, we will give the question answers at the end. So we'll uh, we'll we will pass immediately to the next speaker, who will be Frantisek Svoret. Svoret. Wait, sorry for, for the no, it's presentation. Okay. <laughs> yeah, who, who will who will uh, speak about unconventional techniques to access geothermal resources? Please, Thank you. please keep to the time, 10 minutes. I need help to open the presentation from your side. That was promised. Yes, yes I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, sorry, one second. No. You will? Yeah. Uh, okay, the first picture is there. It, it's coming. Yes. <laughs> I can. I can start. <laughs> I can start. Uh, we are working uh, in a group, and uh, we are trying to reach uh, uh, depth over three and a half kilometers with our equipment. We are working in the petrothermal environment and uh, that is the target. Please take the next slide. Yeah, we believe that it's uh, real with our technology in future, reach such depth. No, go back, go back, please. <laughs> One slide like this. Uh, now it's a presentation who we are. Uh, it's a dividend industry. It's uh, company in Sweden. We have uh, Uppsala University in our group. We have uh, uh, Vunar, which is a company in Slovakia. It was uh, during 40 years responsible for production of drill bits and they, they produce and developed this machine industry, classical machine industry. Our aim is that it's what's the most important thing. It's, it's an establish of human presence in the petrothermal uh, geological regi uh, region in, in the Earth's crust. And uh, the explanation, uh, the petrothermal uh, environment, it's located at depth deeper than three and a half thousand meters, and it's characterized by the hot, dry rock. So we are not working in the hydrothermal environment. It's, it's a normal discussion about drilling that normally we are, we are hearing. Please take next slide. Uh, uh, 
what the petrothermal environment uh, demands, it's uh, uh, establishment of closed loop technologies. And uh, we are working with two strategies. One to uh, build a shaft to such depth. And the second one strategy, uh, develop technology for uh, create spiral tunnels to this depth. Please, next slide. Yeah, if you compare the uh, heat exchange area in the classical borehole drilling, like the Norway we had uh, recently, uh, we are trying to uh, produce artificial slides, cracks in uh, such depths. And you can compare the uh, space heat exchange area between uh, classical drill uh, technology and the uh, slides technology. We can produce slides today about 40,000 square meters heat exchange areas. Please, next, uh, next picture. And 400 ball horse uh, could be replaced by one artificial fracture. So what we are producing in future. Please, next slide. Uh, but we are working with the strategy for multifunction energy shaft, and uh, we are sharing this technology with the deep mining industry, deposit of uh, uh, waste, and so on and so on. And uh, this concept was uh, discussed already by Nikola Tesla, uh, 931, in his uh, presentation, Future Motive Powers. Please, next slide. Uh, those challenges we are meeting, there are, uh, it's, it's possible uh, to build shafts or tunnels at such depths we are talking about. Uh, is it possible to keep the geometrical structures during such pressure we are, we are meeting there? Uh, we need to integrate those systems with classical district heating system. And uh, what we are using, that uh, we have to utilize those multifunctions concept for penetration of aircraft, uh, for production of electricity, generation, different storage, and so on. Uh, we have a group which uh, follows us. Uh, they are working with the economical perspective. It should be calculable, inspectable, serviceable, modularity, and so on. And you, uh, we will see soon this, these models. Please, next slide. And uh, here is the perspective from geothermal energy. Uh, quite near to the surface, we can today uh, create high power seasonal storage. Uh, it could be for cold, it could be for heat, but it's a seasonal storage opportunity which, we are, uh, which is not used uh, in large scale today. Please, next slide. Uh, then it's uh, one business question, and it is electrochemical storage, sodium nickel chloride batteries, what we are testing today for grid stabilization, energy storage, and uh, they are working in intermediate temperatures, uh, often liquid, uh, liquid based electrolytes, and it's pumpable and so on, it's very, very efficient. And the, the, the right side, which is the aim, a uh, large geothermal heat exchanger at sufficient depth, a closed control heat exchanger uh, is constructed for continuous heat extraction. Please, next slide. Uh, then we have a working group. Uh, they are working with uh, carriers for tunnel production, but the aim is the, uh, the same, the heat extraction uh, through those slides at sufficient steps. Please, next slide. Uh, we have uh, two uh, research centers. So the main and big ones are the biggest one. It's a facility in Sweden on an island in the middle of Stockholm, Stura Hagen. Uh, next, please. These are some pictures from the underground facilities where we are working. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, 
we are developing shaft technology for shaft production, deep shaft, and we are we are working with third generation of such technology and a full automatized and uh, it's resistant against the heat. All technology we are working. Please next slide. Next slide. Uh, for the tunnel tunnel boring system. Uh, no, please go back again. <laughs> Uh, uh, we are using uh, the carrier, tool carriers. They are developed by Atlas Copco. And in front, we have uh, a fork uh, for carrying different equipments. Now we have, you can see the wheel, but it will be soon exchanged. We, the, the fork has capacity of 70 tons for, for different tools. And next slide will show you the technology we are working with. We are replacing the front wheel with pulse generator, uh, which allows uh, destruction of say one cubic meter of uh, crystalline uh, crystalline rock, granite in Sweden, and the cost is uh, under 10 kilowatts hour per cubic meter today. Please next slide. Uh, we are working in three groups. Uh, one group is working with uh, block excavation shaft method. The other group is working with tunneling. And then we have a special group for electric pulse boring and tools for creation of different geometrical structures, most slides. Please, next picture. And uh, this is the uh, question we believe in then. Uh, the utilization of geothermal energy in petrothermal environment it's uh, today limited by conventional rotary drilling technology and the, we believe that the belief in rotary drilling could be compared with belief that only with binoculars could mankind investigate all secrets in universal and it was not possible so we need uh, to develop new technologies we have the ambition to colonize space uh, is a similar with the ambition of colonize of earth crust and uh, it requires political ambition, new technology, and measurable targets. And we believe in future where people can benefit from air crust in a similar way, how do they benefit from earth surface? Our goal is to uncover new applications that have a profound positive impact on site and environment and providing a new generation of feasible technology. And the last, please, next, please, slide. This is some kind of uh, uh, picture showing the technologies for penetration of earth crust and the technology for attraction, extraction, and accumulation of energy inside the earth crust. Earth, yes. And then last slide, I think it's coming now. Uh, if you check uh, our homepage, you can see all these technologies in action. Uh, so it uh, shows how it works. And I, we believe that it's the way, it's a multifunction solution and we can share investment when we are going down with deposit industries, with deep mining industry, with uh, agriculture. We have a group for uh, producing food inside the earth craft and we have a special group for Armageddon disasters and survival. So thank you. Thank you very much for this great presentation, which leads us to the science fiction topic, uh, uh, travel to the center of the earth. I hope, I hope that this is coming reality now with your technology and we can harness heat, uh, much, much more heat than we used to by conventional. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll read the question, question answers at the end. So we'll give the floor to our last speaker in this session, who is Colin Brown. From Ever Technologies, and he will speak about enablement of, of high temperature drilling and for multilateral closed loop geothermal systems. Colin, Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Colin Brown. I'm a technology development engineer at Ever Technologies. Um, the subject of the presentation I put together today is based on a paper that we uh, authored and presented at the Stanford Geothermal Workshop uh, that we presented earlier this year in February. Um, the topic of that paper is surrounds the work that we've completed recently to enable 
high temperature hard rock drilling for multilateral closed loop geothermal systems. Uh, and I co-authored this paper with my colleagues at Ever, Michael Holmes, Vlad Zatonsky, and Matt Taves. So for those of you in the audience who are unfamiliar, uh, Ever is a closed loop geothermal company founded in 2017, headquartered in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Our product, the Everloop, is a multilateral closed loop geothermal system. And it can also be classified as an advanced geothermal system as well. The Everloop is a globally scalable form of geothermal energy and can provide both baseload and flexible energy to meet the fluctuating demand of, of end users. Um, the Everloop illustration that you see in the middle of the slide there only shows five laterals, but typical commercial implementations of our design typically have around 12. Uh, so I'll just jump right into it. One of the challenges that we see while drilling these multilateral closed loop geothermal systems revolves around circulating temperatures. So like most geothermal uh, projects, the levelized cost of energy depends on the target formation temperatures. So as you're trying to access hotter rock, not only does that improve your economics, but it also improves the scalability of our technology, uh, as well as reducing the levelized cost of energy. But with increased formation temperatures, that also comes with increased circulation temperatures while drilling. Um, and for our technology anyways, we have to use a lot of uh, complex drilling equipment. So directional drilling equipment, such as MWD or measurement while drilling uh, tools, RSS or rotary steerable tools, as well as magnetic ranging tools. And all of those bottom hole assembly components have temperature limitations in the range of 150 degrees Celsius. It, it depends a little bit on the vendor. Um, but the key challenge for us while trying to access these hot temperatures is how do we keep these tools cool while drilling? The, the first approach that you could take is re-engineering these tools, which can be expensive and time consuming. Uh, and, and particularly at Ever, we don't have the expertise in-house to do that. Uh, the second approach that you can take, which is what we've elected to take, is keeping the, the circulating temperatures cooler while drilling. And what we've done internally is we've implemented a, an insulated drill pipe technology to, to help us do that. So to determine the effectiveness of technologies on cooling, We've developed two internal models, each of varying complexity to determine the pressures and temperatures while drilling. Uh, the first model that I'll quickly take us through here is our steady state model. The mass, momentum, and energy equations take on steady state forms, uh, with the exception of the equations that govern the heat transfer through the rock and into the wellbore, which takes on a pseudo transient form. And what I mean by that is that the heat transfer from the rock in our model will change with flowing time. So as your flowing time increases, the relative amount of heat transfer actually does go down. Um, the model that we've got here is discretized into two sets of grid blocks. The first is shown on the slide in gray. So that's just showing the, uh, the fluid temperatures inside of the drill pipe. And then the second in blue there is the, the fluid in the annular space. So this, this model here isn't purely analytical since it does have an iterative, oh, an iterative solution scheme in the back end, but this model typically takes a couple seconds or fractions of a seconds to, uh, to run. This slide here is just showing some uh, illust illustrative cases, uh, showing five and a half inch drill pipe being drilled to five kilometers deep in a geothermal gradient of 50 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Uh, the only difference between the two cases that I'm gonna get into here is the thermal resistance between the two. Uh, of the drill pipe. Um, so if I direct everybody's attention to the graph on the left-hand slide, side of the slide, on the x-axis we've got fluid temperature and on the y-axis we've got measured depth. The blue curves represent the annular temperatures and then the red curves represent the drill pipe temperatures. The bolder set of lines on the left-hand side of that plot there those show the circulating temperatures in our insulated drill pipe case. And then the, the thinner dashed lines represent the temperatures uh, for a bare carbon steel drill pipe case. And the one thing that I wanna draw attention to is that by using this insulated drill pipe, you can achieve coolings in this illustrative example here of 105 degrees Celsius. So 
the insulated drill pipe has um, max circulating temperatures of 105 degrees Celsius, less than the bare carbon steel case. And because this steady state model is pretty easy to run, it doesn't take very much time, you can run a bunch of different cases. And what you can do with that is basically evaluate the limitations of different dr drilling or cooling technologies. And so if everybody is gonna, again, turn everybody's attention to the plot on the left-hand side there, the curves there are really showing the feasible limits of the cooling technologies given that 150 degrees Celsius circulating temperature limitation of bottom hole uh, tools. So that white line there just represents the bare steel drill pipe case. And everything below that line represents the feasible combinations of geothermal gradient, as well as max well depth that can be exploited with that technology. And then when you incorporate the hypothetical insulated drill pipe case, which is shown by that light blue line, you can see it allows you to access hotter temperatures over a greater range of geothermal gradient and max well depth combinations. So IDP is a really good way of unlocking hotter reservoir temperatures. The, the second model that we developed in-house is a transient model. Uh, and it's really intended to capture the thermodynamic impacts of transient events that you often encounter while drilling. Um, since temperature is the primary concern of our modeling efforts, we've used transient energy equations, but like the steady state model, the mass and momentum equations, again, take on steady state forms. Um, this model is discretized in two spatial dimensions. The first one is in the axial direction, so along the well path. And the second direction is in the radial direction, so outwards from the well. The, the first set of radial blocks, again, shown in gray there, are for the temperatures, or, or sorry, for the fluid in the drill pipe. And the second set of blocks in blue, again, represent the, the fluid in the annular space. And then the remaining orange blocks are just representing the radial slices or rings around the, um, the well. So the numerical discretization of this gridded system for the energy equations gives you uh, a linear system of equations that form a large sparse matrix. And the solution of that matrix gives you the temperature field in both the well and the rock at the next time step. So you can solve that system of equations over and over to basically solve the temperature field at uh, subsequent time steps. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna get too much into the slide. It's just showing the, some examples of the time series inputs into the model, as well as some of the results that come out of it. But the key points I wanna make with this slide here is that with this model, we're able to, to model transient drilling events, things like making connections, um, loss of circulation, taking uh, kicks, that kind of thing can all be handled by this model here. So the slides that have shown up to now have really just shown the modeling capabilities that we've got in-house, but now I wanna cover um, some slides that are dedicated to our EverDeep project, which we executed in New Mexico in the United States in fall of 2022. Um, the EverDeep project utilized a bunch of Ever's proprietary drilling technologies, one of them being the insulated drill pipe. Um, and we drilled this in an area of New Mexico where geothermal gradients can exceed 50 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, this pilot project was designed to replicate the first half of a commercial Everloop. So either the injection or the production side of the closed loop system. And in addition to the temperature measurements that we got while drilling from the MWD tools, we also installed temperature sensors to measure the annular temperature along the, the drill pipe that we used to uh, validate our transient model against. This slide here is just showing uh, the results of that uh, model validation. Um, I won't speak too much to this slide just in the interest of time, but what I wanna draw everybody's attention to in the plot there is the, the measured data is shown in the white open circles and the model predictions are shown in the blue. So you can see visually that there's a pretty good alignment between the, um, the measured data as well as the model predictions, especially in the, the holdout period that you see on the right-hand side of that vertical dashed line representing the, the division between the training period and the holdout period. And one thing that you can do with this transient model is now that we've got a matched model, with the insulated drill pipe, which was shown in the blue 
on the previous slide and also on this slide. But with that same model, you can swap out the insulated drill pipe just for a standard drill pipe case and rerun the model. And those results are shown in green. But the relative difference between those two curves effectively shows you what the insulated drill pipe is capable of in terms of cooling. And what you're seeing on the slide here is that the insulated drill pipe that we've come up with provides up to 90 degrees Celsius worth of cooling relative to a standard drill pipe case. And I know I'm, I'm pretty close to the 10 minutes here, so I'll just uh, quickly close it out here. But the key message to take away from this is that the Everloop is a multilateral closed loop geothermal system. And like many other geothermal systems, its economics are improved with hotter rock temperatures. Because of our complex downhole design, it requires us to use a bunch of different temperature sensitive directional drilling and magnetic ranging tools. Um, the steady state and transient models that we've produced as well are really good for project scoping, technology assessment, and the prediction of drilling life cycle pressures and temperatures. And finally, our successes at Everdeep have proven that insulated drill pipe is a cost effective way of enabling the exploitation of pot formations to improve your geothermal economics and that the developed models that we've got in house are, are accurate in predicting transient drilling thermodynamics as well. And that's all I have and I'll hand it back over to the hosts for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colleen, uh, for this uh, detailed presentation on, on the technology used for drilling these multilaterals and the simulations, which are not easy to achieve in this, uh, in this uh, environment. And uh, now we we have uh, we have time for questions and answers. Uh, well, we have seen uh, essentially presentations which are addressing heat production, uh, drilling technologies and heat production by mostly by conduction and uh, addressing hot rock. So this was quite an interesting session. And uh, well, please, uh, I don't know. There are lots of questions in the chat I don't I don't I didn't see them uh we have comments uh here we go see there were one question for Enig Hansen I think from Bruno de la Vedova yeah yeah it was it was uh he said uh, really innovative uh, thanks he said and uh, and also from Marianne Peterbury, what is uh, the maximum curvature in the loop part? Yeah. So, uh, it's, it's happening, uh, as I, as I um, explained there, actually, we set a logic target of 30 to 50 meters between the parallel sections of the ball there, huh? And that can be wider, I think, as a, but I think that's a, that's a logic distance to set up for us right now. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, we hope to go uh, at sharper angles or uh, shorter radius, but uh, I think let's uh, <laughs> let's not push it too far first. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. Are there any qu other questions or someone who wants to speak up? Please raise your hand. Maybe we can see questions. Yeah, well, uh, there was a question from Michal uh, whether it has been tested in IDP, but uh, we saw from the presentation that this isolated drill pipe was tested. And then, uh, yeah, Colin asked, answered the question. Well, well, thank you very much for all the speakers for for these interesting presentations, which are. In, in, in some sort uh, game changers or future game changers in uh, geothermal energy production. And uh, I wish I wish to all who are researching a great success in their work to diversify the technology of, of producing heat from the ground and from deep ground. Yeah. Uh, well, now I guess we can, I can pass the, the session number two will uh, be chaired by my, by, by Laurent Escar, who is co-chair of co-leader of the World Group on Well Technology from the ATIP 
And then if you have some questions at the end of that session related to this session, you can still ask them. So I hope the, the, the speakers will still stay online and can ask, answer the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Laurent, floor is yours. Okay, thank thank you, thank you very much, Miklos. Then we are, we are going to uh, to to start this second session, which will we, will be more more oriented towards uh, drilling drilling tools and uh, and technologies around drilling tools. Though we have a transition presentation, I would say, a, to start with uh, uh, Christopher Freiberg from uh, uh, Mont Libre, the Mont Libre Group. Uh, who's going to talk to us about the XGEO uh, project, uh, which uh, which is about exploration for for for, for geothermal, about uh, modeling and uh, and exploration. So, uh, Laurent, just uh, there's an issue. He will join in twenty minutes, so maybe oh maybe we, even we, to Volker. Okay, so we, we we can move to a second presentation. So we are going deep down into the subject of drilling tools with. Uh, with uh, Volker Vitik from the Fraunhofer Institute, who's going to talk to us about the geodrill system, and we will we will get uh, we will get Christopher at the end of this session. Thank you very much, Christopher. The, the uh, sorry, okay. Volker, the floor is yours. <laughs> Hello, good morning. Let's get the presentation up here. I to share it yet. Can you see the presentation now? Hello. Yes, we, we can see the presentation, yes. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. Um, it's not in presentation mode, is it yet? It's not in presentation mode for, for, for no, now. We can see on the screen. It's not. Good but morning, everybody. Yeah, My it, name it is now. Volker Wittig from Fraunhofer in Bochum. I present you our geo drill uh, drilling system that we developed in the past three years within a project uh, together with partners from the EU. So why looking into a new drilling system? I think I don't have to go too much into that. We looked into more or less geothermal applications, deep pole hard rock drilling and high temperatures that were our our parameters to go into developing such a new system. So the idea was to create a more or less holistic drilling system for deep drilling and focused on geothermal. There were three parts to this project, three main parts. One was developing a new drilling tool, which we did in Fraunhofer. And uh, I was, will talk, briefly talk about that here and then later in my second uh, presentation. Also, we were looking into uh, new downhole in situ sensor developments and uh, transfer of drilling data. And also we were heavily testing new materials that would help us build these systems, the drilling tools, as well as tool joints and drill pipes. You and our partners, we were our 10 partners from Western Europe. Um, uh, we were the lead on it, TWI, PBI, sensor company from the uh, UK. They were heavily involved, University of Isles and Graffinea Arena for material and also tool joint development. And we also did a lot of modeling uh, from the drilling parameters with Flowfish and then Geolorn uh, helping us getting things into the application. So this was the part on our percussion drilling section, uh, you know, looking uh, to make a new percussion drilling tool at Fraunhofer. As I said, I will talk about that uh, more in detail later. Just to say here, we developed a new switch system to replace mechanical parts inside the hammer to make it much more fit for uh, drill mud applications and low quality water quality applications. So one center part was 3D printing of new vital parts of the hammers, looking into flow simulation and setting it up to uh, get enough drill power output for drilling uh, four, five, six, seven, eight inch diameter uh, hammer setups. This is a little view of the test. And then uh, you were able to see the hammer on the right side. 
Now I will focus more on the second part or the other part of the project was, was about sensor development. And what you see here is a drilling graph from a few years ago, some of you guys may know it, from a deep drilling application with downhole hammers. And what you see here is a very erratic graph of some of the pressures, um, weight on bit, flow rate and torque ratios, which is one of the problems in deep drilling. Uh, why we thought it is very important to have an in situ and online sensor system to help us monitor drilling applications like these, for example, percussion drilling, or these uh, new technologies like electro impulse drilling, plasma pulse drilling, where you don't have weight on bit anymore or, or torque to go by and steer your drilling process uh, or our laser drilling system. That's where you can actually use and apply our sensor system that we developed in GeoDrill with our partners. So that's uh, the overview. It was about materials. On the right side, you see surface material development actually for improving wear um, and wear rates on the tool and surfaces. And then in the center part and on the left part, it was about developing new sensors, flexible sensors that were able to withstand the high g-forces that we see in percussion drilling and also uh, try to make them withstand high temperatures. So two of the worst conditions that we also see in, in, in deep geothermal system, just like what the guys from Ever just talked about. So one part was to, to create a new tool joint system that is able to transfer data and also, of course, uh, keep the inside parts of the drill string pressure tried for running fluids through it. So you see uh, one first part of a wraparound type sensor systems we started to employ to make sure we have real time data transfer, fast tra data transfer through the drill string as a stabilizer. For example, one of the prototypes we developed in order to give us uh, the data connection that we need to our downhole drilling tools uh, while drilling. The other part was the building sensors, new sensors and sensor subs that could be used as uh, complete subs, as you see on the left side here, just being attached in your BHA above your drilling tool to give you any uh, real time data readout, you know, with the accelerometers and everything being able to measure specific energy and of course the normal drilling data that you see on any NWD readout on the rig. And these are a little bit of an insight of the new type of sensor that were developed and being integrated into such system. So what we want from the system is, uh, of course, real-time data readout and uh, data transfer, and also being able later on uh, to go even a step further in a current uh, EU project uh, to use artificial intelligence to move to uh, make sense of the data and use it for even prediction of new drilling operations. And of course, that being all automated at the end of the day. So here you see your, one of our test system scenarios from last year, where we uh, tested all these sensors and connections and made sure that what we measuring down board here was also what we were seeing up hole on the rig and were able to control it. And this is the picture from the the uh, recent field test we did on our side uh, a few weeks ago with our partners demonstrating the sensor readout and the data transfer through the drill string as we were drilling with our new downhole hammer, you know, seeing the data on the screen in uh, online, online fashion. So what does that mean? Number one, we developed a new tool, drilling tool, you know, in this, uh, situation it was a downhole hammer so giving us the worst vibration you can think of and on the other hand having a complete data readout in situ that can be used for example in scenarios like this percussion drilling and seismic wire drilling using our percussion hammer as a good seismic force a seismic source for looking ahead of the drill bit or describing even the geology around the, the drill string as we drill for current and then also planned uh, uh, future drilling applications. And as I said earlier, 
you can use this data system also for uh, electro impulse drilling, uh, laser drilling, the new drilling um, technologies of the future there where we will most likely not have a weight on bit and torque parameters anymore. So that was in short uh, the summary of our geo drill system comprised of new tools and especially also uh, sensor and data transfer system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Volker. That's a very interesting subject because it covers a lot of things. We are talking about tools, but we are also talking about maybe as far as uh, as uh, drilling technology and as ours are concerned, we, we we are really geothermal or oriented here, and also we we have this insight on the uh, importance to have data, drive with data, and understand the rocks we are drilling. So that was quite a comprehensive uh, presentation, and thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I guess we, uh, I don't know if we uh, if we if we take questions now. I don't see any question or discussions at Maybe the moment. Collect them and, and report them in the Q and A session at the end. Yeah. I don't see I don't see any right now. So we are going to move to the the next presentation. Thank you, Volker. Again, we uh, we are moving to. Uh, uh, Adele Manzella, who, uh, who is going from the CNR in Italy, who is going to talk to us about the uh, DPU project, uh, again about uh, drilling tools here, about uh, uh, laser combined with uh, cryogenic, uh, uh, cryogenic flushing. Uh, Adele, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you hear me and you see my screen now in uh, presentation we, mode. We yeah. see the presentation in presentation mode, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I speak, uh, Eloisa uh, should have been here, but uh, there are troubles in uh, entering the, the, the webinar, so I present for her. Um, this is a, uh, which is dedicated to a, mainly to drilling, new drilling technologies. Um, we just started, sorry, we just started the project one year ago, Goes. So we are still in the in the um, preliminary phase in uh, in the setup, but uh, I will show you the concepts. Um, so the, the goal of the project is uh, um, similar to uh, those that I already heard before. So we want to access uh, the underground uh, in any condition, uh, and in particular, we are focused on uh, deep uh, heat exchangers. Um, so closed loop, uh, not uh, coaxial. You will see. We will see later why. Uh, so the the technologies that we are developing and testing uh, is uh, specifically um, uh, designed for uh, this kind of uh, deep uh, uh, heat exchangers. The project is. Uh, um, uh, is going to stop at the validation in the lab. This is important to take into account. Um, but there are many things that uh, has been uh, developed. So the main concept is uh, a joining methodologies. So uh, laser drilling uh, methods combined with cryogenic gases for cooling the laser drill health. So to improve uh, the rate of penetration, so reduce the drilling time uh, and cost, and also obtaining uh, possibly, this is going to be checked, uh, a glazed layer uh, on the borehole walls, um, so that uh, at the end of the drilling, uh, the system in principle should be already isolated from the surroundings formation and uh, ready for, um, for testing and for becoming in operation. So without requiring further casing activities, and this would uh, uh, further reduce the cost uh, and time for uh, setting up the heat exchangers. Um, the, um, uh, the main objectives of the, of the project, oops, sorry, uh, I am trying to move this to um, develop and to calibrate, to validate at the lab scale uh, these, uh, these concepts. So um, the selection uh, of cryogenic gas is one of the first thing and the, uh, up to now the cryogenic gas has been chosen. Um, the, the, the colleagues will have to develop an innovative lightweight string, uh, deal string 
to host uh, both the laser and, uh, and uh, to have the cryogenic gas flushed in the borehole. Um, and they are uh, designing the tool to, to, for the specific temperature control analysis uh, because they need to combine the heat and uh, sustain the multilateral drilling. Um, this design is accompanied by um, a, a lot of petrophysical uh, uh, and physical thermal uh, uh, analysis uh, for different lithologies to uh, check the borehole wall vitrification and integrity and also the duration of all these. Um, and uh, part of, these, of the project is also dedicated to legislative aspects, environmental standards and uh, uh, modeling uh, and uh, feasibility studies uh, and economic studies. Okay. Uh, at the moment, uh, after one year of project, uh, uh, some results have been achieved. As I mentioned, uh, cryogenic gas has been chosen. Um, there has been uh, a 3D printed uh, uh, prototype of uh, um, wellhead, um, uh, which is uh, in titanium, uh, to, to, to meet all the, all the foreseen uh, uh, condition um, for mechanical strength and temperature resistance. And this uh, um, drill head uh, is, uh, uh, has already embedded uh, this gas channel so that uh, the, the, the cryogenic gas can be focused uh, at, in, the, in the well head. And uh, uh, there has been uh, a, um, for, the moment, for the moment, the setup of the laboratory uh, where the first experiment uh, at the moment just for laser but soon uh, the, the, uh, the new test with laser and cryogenic gas uh, uh, will be carried on. Um, the, the lab includes uh, this uh, laser system, which is uh, uh, driven uh, by a robot in a robotic way, and uh, the processing optics uh, uh, and the gas feeding system. Um, at the moment, with just uh, laser drilling, uh, uh, they already obtained uh, uh, up to 20 meters per. Um, so a, a, an interesting uh, rate of penetration. But of course, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the testing is uh, just at the, at the beginning. So uh, this is just the first, uh, the first experiment uh, uh, carried on. At the same time, uh, uh, rock samples uh, uh, obtained after the drilling uh, are being analyzed at the University of Padua and uh, the uh, thermophysical effects uh, are, going, uh, are uh, going to be assessed. Um, so considering the different kind of uh, um, effects that laser and cryogenic gas may cause on the, on the different rock samples. Um, and you see here a few uh, of the uh, of the rocks samples that uh, are going to be are, at the moment uh, already starting to be analyzed uh, in uh, in Padua uh, for the wall vitrification and integrity. Of course, this will depend also on the kind of rocks, and for this reason, many kind of uh, of uh, units uh, are being uh, processed. Um, an exploitation potential will be um, is part of the project uh, to de to define uh, the economics uh, by my modeling, uh, by the cost uh, of the drilling technology, and uh, le also the legislative aspects uh, are going to be uh, assessed. Uh, at the moment, uh, we are at this phase of a review, first review uh, for comparison. Uh, with the the, this, the, the, the already uh, known uh, drilling systems um, and also a risk assessment uh, uh, is uh, under development. These are the partners of the project. Um, I am from CNR and uh, we are doing the modeling uh, and the, and the uh, communication and dissemination of the project. Uh, the coordinator is the University of Padua in Italy, and uh, the, the, uh, there are uh, Fraunhofer, there is Fraunhofer for the laser methodologies uh, prevent for the cryogenic gas uh, and the combination with laser 
uh, methodologies uh, GeoServe and RED uh, for um, uh, following the and all the other aspects of the of this technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adele. I think that we have a couple of questions on the uh, on the on the chat, Philippe. Um, and uh, the first is from uh, from Henning, who talked uh, a few a few minutes earlier, who's asking how is it performing in a well bore where a larger volume of water is present. And with a, a second insight, which is perhaps our locomotive for propulsion could be used with your laser drilling unit. I think that Kevin is uh, may may answer better than me. Uh, can you help me, Kevin? Kevin Mali is uh, good in the... morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Kevin. Good morning. Uh, it, we're still at an early stage on, you know, the lithologies and downhole conditions. We're sort of working very much on perfecting the drilling technology first. And then as we move along, we will address certain, you know, litho lithologies are always very difficult to, to overcome with whatever drilling system. So I think we'll be looking at, uh, you know, other drilling systems, and, and um, Henning, yours is very interesting in, indeed uh, about moving drill pipe in and out of the hole. Uh, with you know whether we can use it with the cryogenic system remains to be seen. But I look forward to talking to you next week when you're back in the USA, Henning. Hope that answers that question. By the way, I must declare an interest because I'm involved in. Geodrill and Optidrill as well with the Volker. Hey, good morning, Kevin. <laughs> okay, and there was a second uh, question from uh, uh, Alpha Zazi, I, I guess I, I pronounced the first name well. Uh, Adele, will this method be applicable to any type of rocks or is there any limitation in the application? Where, in, in a few words, what is the, the, the frame of application in terms of, of, of terrain? Um, it, we are working on uh, uh, testing different kinds of rocks uh, from uh, granites uh, to limestones. So in principle, what we are, we are looking at uh, a, a wide range of, uh, of rocks. Uh, but of course, the vitrification effect will be different. So this is why all this testing on different kinds of rocks. So still in a preliminary phase, let's see. It is very much a research, a research project. So uh, the, 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 the different effects uh, will be visible, will be more understood later on. So let's hope in another webinar uh, in one year and uh, more answer, uh, more answer to all these questions. I also see other questions and uh, um, uh, I, I think, for example, for the Hansen, uh, we will keep in touch with you and uh, see how we can uh, uh, discuss the technical detail more on uh, on, on this, okay? Uh, yeah, I had also a question, uh, another question, I think, if, if I think it was more for Volker, actually, from what I see on the... On the, on the, so yes, maybe may, may, maybe people can get it touched directly, Adele. I don't know if more questions from the te purely technical point of view. Okay. And we can, we can move towards the uh, next presentation, uh, uh, which uh, will come from uh, Navid Velmurgan uh, from the Min Paritech. And Navid is going to uh, talk about, uh, to, to us, sorry, about the project ORCHID. Uh, again, about drilling, uh, the drilling technology, drilling tools, combining hydrojet and percussion for uh, ROP improvement. Navin, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Okay, and we can see your presentation in presentation mode. It's okay. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm Naveen Velmurgan. I'm the scientific and technical manager for ORCID. I'm here to present a simple case study from the project where we were able to show some uh, multifold increase in the drilling performance by combining uh, two different mature technologies, which is 
uh, high pressure water jetting and uh, percussion drilling. Uh, this particular project is coordinated at uh, Armin or Mean Paritech by uh, Dr. Laurent Jabo and uh, Professor Hedi Salami. And the consortium is made up of uh, the university in, in Paris. We have Imperial College London, who works on simulation of rock characterization and so on. And we have Sintef from Norway. We have University of Piraeus Research Center from Greece, who works on the environmental and social acceptance of new technologies. We have our industrial partner, Dillstar Industries, who are based in France, um, who's, who is collaborating on building the prototype. And uh, we also have an external partner who is uh, University of Petroleum in China, uh, from whom we are, we are actually uh, collaborating on uh, improving a new technology on intensive air. So this particular project was uh, funded by the European Union under the Horizon 2020 uh, program. And uh, I'll just explain you what we have done so far. So it is clear from all the, uh, all the presentations and uh, the recent studies that we have large difficulty in improving the drilling rates in uh, hard crystalline rocks, especially that are found in uh, deep geothermal applications. And what we have seen so far and did some analysis uh, based on our study, that if we are able to increase our rate of penetration in those zones by, let's say, two to three times than the conventional rate of one to two meters an hour, we could uh, potentially cut the total drilling costs by 65 percentage. So that's the problem statement and motivation behind this particular project. And uh, we, in particular, use an approach called self-relief drilling which is to reduce the stress concentration at the rock surface facing the drilling bit. As you can see on the figure left, the stress is usually concentrated in the, in the center of the, of the rock face in, uh, in particular bit profile. But we would like to, what we have seen theoretically is by changing the uh, profile of the drill bit and thus the rock surface, we can modify the stress distribution. And this particular, stress distribution can be modified further if we have a peripheral groove slotted like this along the well bore. So there is a particular ratio between the, uh, the diameter and the, and the groove depth about which we can really reduce, we can have a minimum concentration of stress here. So uh, the reason behind this is when you have less stress in the rock, then we need less energy to break the rock and thus we have higher rate of uh, drilling performance. And how we do that is by combining two mature technologies that already exists. The first one is the using the percussion drilling. We will we use mud hammer that is produced by our partner drill star industries. And we combine it with uh, an intensifier, which is used to generate high pressure jets in the downhole environment. So the idea is to build a prototype that can combine these two and, and have a bottom wall assembly where we have an intensifier that can produce the high pressure water jet that can go up to 200 megapascals that will flow to the periphery of the drill bit. And to create a slot, then we can use percussion drilling to break the rock. At the current stage in the laboratory study, we are using a high pressure pump that can deliver this water jet at the moment for experimental studies. But for the field applications, we would like to combine it with an intensifier in the downhole environment. The project involves mainly on the technical side, three different uh, packages. The first one to study the optimal bit profile and the groove depth to minimize the stress concentration. The second one being how to optimize the jetting process and understand all the operational parameters to optimize this process. And then the third one is on the percussion drilling, which is to how to deliver the mechanical energy and or percussive energy to break the rock and optimize the, uh, the whole process. Uh, the first step is on uh, the uh, on the experimental side on understanding the insert layout and uh, how much rock volume we could remove based on a given percussive energy. So we have a laboratory set up in the south of France in Po, where we have tested with the different uh, insert shapes and sizes different energy, impact energy, and uh, we were able to validate our simulations using uh, these kind of sort of experiments. So then we can further work on how to optimize the insert layout to maximize the volume of rock removed uh, for a given operational input. So 
and, and, and the second part on the high pressure water jetting. Here is a sample that we have tested. This is a Sidob granite uh, where we have, uh, this is the peripheral slot that we have created by having a, a high pressure water jet of 200 megapascals or 2000 bars with a back pressure of about 250 bars in the chamber. Uh, so we have tested different type of rock and uh, different parameters and understood the sensitivity of the input to, to know how much volume has been removed by the high pressure water jet and what will be its impact on improving the drilling rate. Here is just, uh, it's a sample of uh, how we are able to visualize the crater generated by one particular jet impact. Uh, we can then calculate the amount of uh, rock that has been removed. And in the bottom, we have shown, oh, this is a study of sensitivity of different parameters. For example, standoff here means the distance between your uh, the, the nozzle output and the rock surface. And you can see here that as the standoff increases, we have less energy to break the rock and thus the peripheral groove that was created is quite minimal towards the end. And uh, what we have observed was the back pressure had quite a lot of influence. So deeper the operation, the less influential is your uh, high pressure water jetting and creating a groove. And this is a uh, observable uh, correlation where you have, when you have higher injection pressure, you have higher energy to break the rock. So you have deeper groove uh, when you increase the injection pressure. All this study has been uh, done experimentally as well. So we have uh, set up, as I said, in the south of France in Po where we have a vertical uh, drilling rig, which can emulate different systems and uh, downhole environment up to five kilometers. Uh, what we have done is we have modified the, uh, the, the experimental bench to adapt for these kind of experiments. So here is an overview where you have the rock sample and the drill bit. And we can have uh, confining pressure and different stresses uh, that we can uh, dynamically modify. What we have done is uh, we have inserted a different uh, a high pressure line that is connected to a high pressure pump that can deliver the, the water jet at 200 megapascal. So the end result is something like this. This is a first prototype that we have built where we have a hammer and a high pressure water jet coming out on the, on the periphery of, of, the, uh, of the drill bit. So this is where the drill bit uh, or the rock will be placed. This is our testing protocol where we first fully engage the drill bit, then we use rotary and hammer uh, action. Then we activate the high pressure water jet and observe what is the ROP. And we drill a particular section and then we stop the uh, high pressure water jet and use only the rotary and hammer action. And we see what will be the results. So these are some experimental results where you know you can we have started our high pressure water jet here and uh, Please use this zone as the observable limit. You can see as soon as we stop the high pressure uh, water jet, we have a reduction in the ROP. So the overall analysis says that we have about 2.5 times faster drilling performance when we combine the hammer and high pressure water jet as compared to using only the hammer. And uh, we have also observed that if we are able to normalize this value, that is, if you call it as drillability, ROP divided by weight on bit, because it's difficult to maintain weight on bit constant during hammer action. So in that case, we have seen at least three to four times improvement as compared to conventional tri roller bit and so on. So what we have seen so far is that the peripheral groove that we have uh, utilized from the concept of self-relief drilling has a crucial role to play in terms of improving the drilling rate. And uh, as I showed you, this test was done in Sidob granite, and we were able to increase the uh, rate of penetration by at least 2.5 times. And uh, we would like to move forward and see how the test would be uh, impacted if you have different sort of stress regimes in the dynamic uh, regime, and also what will happen if you have different type of nozzles or different type of rock. So. Uh, we already have planned that in the, in the program. We have a uh, few granites as the candidates and also some hard uh, sandstone. 
So thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I would like to thank again the European Commission for this funding and our consortium partners in, uh, in carrying out this work. Uh, thanks a lot. And you may contact us, either of us, Laura Haidi or uh, myself, if you have any questions. And uh, please follow us in these social media to have uh, regular updates on what we are doing. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Naveen. Um, I think that we have a, a, one question from Kevin on the uh, on the chat, which I'm, I'm going to, uh, to 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 handle to you. You can read it on the chat also. Um, ROPs above 20 meta, uh, with the DTH and PDC technologies in more than 200 megapascal formations uh, is, is achievable already. Will the ORCID system result in greater bit on bottom time to help reduce overall cost? Yeah, great question. So it is true that we have uh, some situations where we have used PDCs like uh, in Utah for our for, uh, projects where uh, we were able, they have observed more than 20 meters per hour ROPs, uh, but we are not sure if it is transferable to different type of uh, geological locations. And this is something that we would like to compare uh, down the lane when we go for field study. Because at the moment, we we are limited by the laboratory, you know, uh, physical constraints on, on how much power we can deliver to the hammer at the moment, because we're actually using at about 30% of the overall power. So we are yet to fully discover how this performance will increase or be comparable to other hammer and PDC technologies when it comes to real field applications. So I would say we have to wait and watch. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, we are going to move to the next presentation. Volker, uh, Volker is back uh, to talk to us about the new development of hydraulic DTH. So we are coming back to percussion drilling uh, with this uh, presentation. Uh, no, sorry to interrupt, but just to but Christopher Freiberg has joined, so he'll be the last presenter. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, thank you very much. So, so we will have the presentation. That's good news. So, Volker, the, the, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, let me get back okay. here. <laughs> in presentation mode. Let's see. It's Zoom, not Teams. Okay. Let's see. Can you see it now? Um, yeah. we, see, we see the presenter side, so it's not the, the right uh, screen that we, that it's you share, right I think. Screen. Can we share another one? Let's so see. you might just... Can you share? Might just switch to the other screen. This Here is it is. We, we are okay now. It's it's perfect. All right. Thanks. Back on stage. Um, now I'll talk to you about percussion hammer drilling, which we heard a lot about from other guys. Um, okay. Continue. Yeah. Okay. So from our department, we deal with a lot of drilling technologies, percussion drilling being one, and also thermal drilling technologies being what is the stuff of the future, as you see here. So, um, you know, Kevin just also asked the question on ROP stuff. You know, it seems like DTH hammers is a good bridge technology for now to get us over to the next hump maybe of possible thermal drilling as we heard from others uh, with laser or electro impulse. So look a little bit, let's look some more in detail on the DTH hammer stuff that uh, we have known for many years. You know, there's a lot of air drilling going on, which which shows us how fast you can drill with, with a hammer system. We are looking in the fluid water hammer system that have been around namely from Vasara for the last 30, 40 years with the problems that they don't really have a high lifetime. And though they don't allow for us to use drill mud, which we want to, ch uh, to change. So here's a picture from drilling activities down to three, four, five kilometer depth with uh, water type hammers, you know, showing us a fairly good ROP of, you know, here only 10, 12 meters an hour, but they can certainly do more as we know. 
So how are these hammers set up? Uh, typically, there are two options for us. We have a flow-through solution, which you see up here on the right, where all the, the fluid, the drill fluid or drill mud is pumped through the whole uh, drilling or percussion section, uh, which is the stuff I will be talking about. And then there are so-called external loop systems where you actually have a separate circuit down hole uh, providing you the percussive force, you know, you could generate um, your own hydraulic uh, circuit down hole, or you can generate electricity and then power percussion section. And there are even solutions out on that, but typically then you lose quite a bit of efficiency. So let, let's look more on the flow through systems that we have and that you know from Basara and Drill King Taipangs and all the being on the market and whatever the guys run in the ORCID project, it's also flow through type hammer. And this is typically what you find inside of such a hammer, like looks like a Swiss watch, many, many parts that need to operate. And the main part is typically some valve system that actually then controls the piston and makes the piston move up and down. And with a lot of intricate parts and channels. And you can imagine if you pump anything but clean water through there yeah, that you run into problems, at least with performance and, and lifetime, if you don't have a complete failure right away. And these are the parts uh, you look at in real life. Uh, we have drilled with them many years, many meters. We know where they fail and why they fail. Main part typically is a piston here. And also the part that gives you a lot of problems is typically the control valves. And this is where we went and set up to set up a new percussion engine reducing you know, these kind of parts that you see here, okay? So that was the goal of our work. And we were looking into a hydraulic part uh, known as a fluidic switch based on the Gonda effect that's been known for the physicians for many hundred years, where the water follows along the surface here, and then you can switch it from one side to another. So that is the basic part for our hammer and control system. And when you look at it, it can do it nicely just by itself, or um, you can actually connect to it a uh, consumer at the end, okay? So this is just switching it by itself when you run fluid through it at a certain flow rate. And then when you add a consumer to it, it does the switching, uh, on its own. So this is uh, where we started to just to set up a basic system, you know, to figure out what is the connection between flow rate and frequency, and then available power that we can use. And this was all done with just uh, simulation and then rapid prototyping. And then the big step was go to metal production, which you see here in the picture. And one uh, problem was already you don't see anymore what you get after 3D printing. And so we use CT scanning to look at our flow channels, also to evaluate the surface structures, which is all rather very important to make the switch work uh, properly in a way that you want it to work. So with that all done, then we set out and actually set up a new percussion unit, uh, which you see on the right side from all the many parts on the left. We went to the right side, having our switch unit up on top and then the piston actually that gives us the drilling power and the drilling energy that we need that needs to be moved up and down below. And we ended up with a hammer that is only one moving part left inside and not many moving parts as we are used to the industry tools from the past. So this is our was our goal and we were actually quite quite successful to achieve that. And then we set up uh, Testing is a very big percussion unit with up here. This and below, what we are actually doing here is to match frequency and flow rate. What we have is to set up percussion unit for flow, run the switch for flows by the this is what you want to test the sides of it. 
And then on the drilling simulator, we can run it actually to, uh, with the whole system here in, in, in rocks and validate the system. And this picture you may remember from earlier, which is even combined with the sensor system, then later for deep downhole drilling. And we get the whole component field test uh, running the percussion unit. Uh, together with our sensor system to get the readout and control that also hopefully helps us to run a system in deep four or five kilometer environments uh, because running a system like a hammer with a non-compressive medium like water or drill mud much more sensitive to that than running air hammers with a compressive medium where you have a wide range of operating window and it narrows down quite a bit when you run compressive media like drilling fluids. Okay, that was it already all on the percussion hammer section, which will be and can be included in all the percussion units that you may run. Typically, a lot of them on the market are still based on the Vasara design that has its dilemmas on, on very low service life and with this percussion unit uh, we tested it even with the braces uh, last year we are a very good uh, way to have a much more rugged system for the downward percussion unit okay thank you very much thank you very much uh, Volker for for this presentation I should say this update because we we can see the subject progressing year after year uh, and, and and as you all noticed we, we we had a couple of a few presentations on the on on this so good, good to see that things are are moving forward and, and thanks again for for the update I, I don't think I think that we don't have any questions on the on the chat right now we had connection problems. I, I, I think that the, the, there is an issue when we have both voice and videos at the same time with uh, with limited connections. That was maybe the reason. Um, and now we are going to move to Christopher that managed to to join us. And thank you very much. So Christopher Freiberg from the Mont Libre Group, who's going to talk to us about XGO. And then we're moving back to exploration, subject, exploration and modeling subjects related to drilling. Uh, Christopher, if you are with us, the, the floor is yours. I am. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Excellent. I'm Christopher Freiberg. I'm currently in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm representing a small R&D and technical development company called Montlibre Group. And I'm personally coming from a long background in this uh, emerging drilling technology that was just described by Volker and the previous speaker before him. I am turning now slightly in... Uh, another direction. I'm not talking specifically about drilling techno technology, but supportive technology for drilling. Because when we work with these Vasara and Hanjin water hammers, we learned that we also need to see into the bedrock. We need to increase the visibility of the exploration and the pre-study. And the system I'm presenting today is a revolution in that field. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you something called XGEO, a revolution for the global geothermal and geological resource exploration industry. This is an image showing how the energy use and various solutions will emerge over time. And the quick conclusion is that fossil fuels remains the same, basically. Unfortunately, it still increases. But there is a lot of progress in renewable energy, uh, but not so much visible yet in geothermal energy. Still 2040, geothermal is expected to be one of the smaller alternatives, which I think is a big misunderstanding on the global energy scene, because geothermal has immense opportunities. The problem today, if we look into the mineral exploration industry, is that we use very rudimentary methods to analyze, to detect, to visualize what we have in the bedrock. Here we see a gentleman, a team member of Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos' team on Greenland looking for cobalt with a very rudimentary rudimentary method. There are also a, a series of very advanced technologies Upper right corner, you see a picture of famous German machines measuring seismic reactions. 
we all know that the standard solution used by everyone is core drilling and test drilling, and that typically ends up in geochemical analysis in laboratories, i.e. giving very detailed information, but also like a toothpick into a cake, very detailed on the specific location, but not whatsoever in the volume that we want to explore. If we look at the geothermal industry, the challenge today is that we use immensely big and costly drilling systems, very expensive to establish and very expensive to operate. And with, of course, an exponential uh, exploration cost with the drilling depth. And therefore we need to drill more efficiently directly to the heat source in the case of geothermal. And that's where we come into the picture potentially. We have developed a technology based on a scientific principle called pulsed electromagnetic sounding PEMS. This equals in a simplified form the magnetic camera used in our hospitals today to visualize our human body. But instead of the body, we look into the planet Earth and we can do so with extreme precision down to single meter precision on several kilometers of depth. And we can see the bedrock down to 10,000 meter, 10 kilometer. So basically beyond any modern exploration today. And we can do so onshore on land, but also offshore through the sea and through the sea bottom, which by the way, as I am sure you know, is the next big revolution, sea bottom mining. So altogether, we can help all the drilling and exploration companies to visualize, to show, to analyze the, the resource, whether it is minerals, metals, or geothermal heat, or uh, an explorable heat zone. The way how we conduct this practically is that we scan vast areas. We started using helicopters. Now we are moving more and more in the direction of advanced high payload drones. And we have already tested such solutions here in Sweden, together with a defense company with a very, very advanced mini helicopter of three, four, five meter. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too exclusive for our demand. So we're going in the direction of high payload, uh, battery driven drones. Basically we scan a geographical area defined by the client, obviously. We send out this digital battery driven signal and we listen and analyze to the response echo data from this uh, signal. And we interpretate that via a special software that we have developed so that we can develop three dimensions images like on the left side of the picture here and showcase where there is an aquifer or where there is a heat zone or where there is a suitable explorable geotechnical zone. Uh, we can conduct this in various forms. The si most simple form is boots on the ground, walking in, in the nature, carrying the mobile equipment. But more typically we use uh, land vehicles uh, cars or jeeps driving over the area if it is feasible. We also use sea vessels and exploration ships through the sea. And very commonly, historically, we have used helicopters. We have worked on this development over the last couple of years. And recently we have done 10 various test and verification projects in all kinds of global locations to to make sure that we know all kinds of geological conditions. We know it works, but we are still in an early commercial stage. We are entering the first projects now. Here you can see images of the first Swedish solution we use to carry our system. This is the Swedish high capacity drone. It carries 200 kilo for up to 500 kilometer over five hours, completely autonomously. You control it like a defense missile from inside a mobile container that is located on the site via a truck. We have an amazing team based partly here in Stockholm and our major technological team is driven by some of the world leading geotechnical scientists based at our technical center in Kiev in Ukraine. And they are also working for the Ukrainian Institute of Science and Technology. And we have also several field teams ready to go anywhere in the world 
to do these scannings and to deliver the reports and the material that is the outcome of our service. We address now several major markets in our view. One is obviously global exploration of minerals, metals, rare earth, water, etc. The other big opportunity for us is deep geothermal establishments. And we very closely watch the activities in Finland, in Helsinki. We were historically deeply involved in that project. Unfortunately, they have had a big problem now. They can't see into the bedrock 6.4 kilometer in the granite in Helsinki to understand how to explore the geothermal exploration zone. They have the temperature, but they cannot extract the, the energy sufficiently. And we can help them with that. These markets are immensely big. Mining and minerals is several trillion US dollar. It grows by 13% annually. And until 2050, it's expected by the World Bank to grow by 500% as a reflection of the global transformation. So there's a massive demand for these systems and solutions. We are currently working with a number of early prospects. One is a Swedish owned gold mine in the northern part of Norway, looking for our service to prepare for the exploration. The second is we are working for the the government of Dominica in the Caribbean region, helping them to establish a large geothermal system, not the first one on the island. It's a volcanic island like Iceland. And their specific objective is to build a hydrogen plant from the electricity of this uh, uh, geothermal plant. And the, the third prospect for us is, of course, ST1 in Finland, where we would like to help them to visualize the geothermal exploration zone. We would also like now to accelerate and help EJECT and the members. And we have a proposal today uh, in the name of our activity here in Sweden and to connect with the historical geotechnical related innovation by Alfred Nobel. We would like to offer you as members an economical uh, opportunity in the form of an award to the value of 250,000 euro. This is something we will provide as a value voucher to one of the Egypt members that would like to deploy our service during 2023. Uh, so you are welcome to contact me to get more information and we can exchange how we can help you in the specific location. I would like to take this opportunity to thank EJECT, the president Miklos Antix and the vice president Marco Camila and also Christina helping with the practical and all you uh, listening uh, audience today. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Christopher Freiberg. I am the co-founder and CEO of Monlibre Group in Stockholm, Sweden. And we are available on xgeo.se and via telephone. The slides here have been provided to eject so you can all have it shared via email. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. And uh, I, I guess that your proposal has been has been heard by the, the many people that are connected today. I would very much <laughs> hope so. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully, um, I'm checking right now. Do we have any uh, Do we have any questions on the uh, on the on the chat? We have one question from uh, Michael Masek. Christopher, what are the approximate cost of sounding per square kilometer and what is the time it takes to perform the survey and interpret the results? Yes, excellent question. Let me start by the second part, the time it requires. A complete project is typically in the time range between five to ten weeks. So practically two, three months from starting point doing the scanning we collect the data we send it to our data center in kiev we do the analysis which requires very advanced know-how by our geotechnical specialists and they transform via our software these uh, response data to three-dimensional pictures so the deliverable from us in five to ten weeks is a report that is accompanied by 3D images that showcases the specific target zone. And the cost of doing this is, of, of course, there is no standard price. Obviously, it's dependent on how large area would you like to scan and which method 
is the most suitable. Can we do it boots on the ground, a small area, or do we need these airborne solutions, drones and helicopters? They are fairly expensive. And of course, uh, it varies over time. Uh, we have right now an ongoing active offer for scanning on the island of Dominica in the Caribbean region. That specific offer is in the range of 400,000 euro for the complete service. But this can be broken down in the various parts. And if someone of you would like to challenge us with an in inquiry, we are more than happy to provide an offer. Hope you could hear my okay. answer. Yes, of course. Thank you. And a compl complimentary question from Michel again. Is scanning in a highly industrialized area a problem? Uh, we have to probably make some reservations. We know that urban environments today and industrial parks can be a massive amount of competing signals, wireless networks, telecom, data transfer, and other technical systems. So I should not say that it's a full green line everywhere. We, we have to understand the specific location, basically, to make an offer. But we have not encountered any major showstoppers until date. Uh, we use a signal, by the way, which is completely harmless to people, animals, vegetables and the environment. It's a battery driven, low power digital signal. But the immense uh, opportunity for us is that this signal can travel down to 10 kilometers into the bedrock. And this is, by, by the fact, not the absolute limitation. This is controlled by our engineers for practical reasons. We see no reason at the moment to let the signal detect and analyze deeper locations than 10 kilometers because everything today is in the range, one or a few, or in the most extreme cases, five, six, seven kilometers. But beyond that, very, very rare. Okay, so I think that Michel, Michel, Michel updated uh, talking about noise. So I guess, I guess there was a question of the yes. noise. Yeah. Uh, we do not and, create any major noise because it's a low power battery driven system. A uh, question from uh, Vincent, Vincent Dupont. What is the scan surface in Dominica for, 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 for uh, 400 Ks? Very good question. The first uh, question requirement was that they wanted us to scan the entire island of Dominica, ah. which is fairly okay. large. And that is very feasible and possible. And we sourced helicopters to do so. And when they saw the cost, they reverted a bit and they said, can we start by looking at the specific area of Portsmouth, where we have done traditional detection and analysis for a few years ago. So now we have done a smaller, more limited starting research offer. And that lands around 400,000 euro complete turnkey solution. And there we would also use helicopters, but we are now looking into a, a new opportunity that came very, very recently to use a new US made battery driven drone, which would reduce considerably the cost of the helicopter service. And as you all know, drones are being developed rapidly for both civil and defense reasons among other Ukraine having a conflict at the moment in their country is very, very far ahead in drone development. And we benefit from that as well. But US and Europe is also far ahead. And of course, South Korea as an example. Okay. Other, other question uh, are, 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 are raising. Uh, complimentary question from Vincent. You are still not giving the surface uh, scanned. Uh, is 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 it at uh, is it at this point uh, marketing a bit more than that? Uh, do you have do you have numbers and, and feedback from yes, uh, from the field? Yes, we have we have numbers and feedback from ten previous test and trial projects in global variable locations, but we have not yet done a full commercial project, uh, and that's our goal now this year to start the commercial introduction of this service. And that's why we would also like to especially support EJECT's member with this voucher I mentioned. 
The technology okay, yeah. is patented first time in 2019 and most recently in 2021. So we have double patents, one specific technological and one system patent. And the, 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 the process, the puzzle consists of three parts. Obviously, the digital hardware system that we carry and scan with. The second part is the software that enables us to interpret the response signals. And the third part is the human expertise in our team to be able to analyze and convert this to readable, understandable uh, pictures and reports. I, I think that the first part of the question of Vincent was about the, the actual surface scanned in Dominica, if, I, if I'm correct. And Vincent, yes, is correct. It's me a couple of square kilometers we are looking at right now. Okay. Um, and uh, finally, question, uh, it's the same range, maybe question from Michel Garcia to, to you, Christopher, do you, do you have any publication, scientific publications uh, uh, that present the, the, the methodology already, uh, already yes, uh, there available? Are, yes, there are early such uh, papers. If you Google uh, the four letter PEMS for pulsating electromagnetic sounding, you will most likely find one of the early scientific reports that was written by our scientific head of R&D, Mr. Igor Skopchenko, and that is available publicly on the internet. But personally, I believe we shall complement this with more focused reports for specific target areas, like either mining or exploration of water, or in your case, of course, geothermal energy. They are slightly different in their approach, obviously but there are many common denominators between them. Okay. For instance, the, the detection of water, which we have verified and successfully established, the simplicity of that and the simplicity of geothermal detection of explorable uh, uh, fracture zones or permeable zones or aquifer, it's very similar, obviously. But there are also very special key knowledge you have to have from the geothermal sector to really uh, optimize the benefit of this data. Okay. If Thank you no very more much. Question, I'm Christopher. very grateful for your questions and your consideration, and you are more than welcome to contact me any feasible way. Yeah, obviously, I think that there might be many questions for following this presentation. Many thanks for for for, for that, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. This this concludes this concludes the the, the this session of of, of presentations. Uh, Philip, uh, maybe uh, I can leave you the floor now for the for the conclusions. Yes, uh, thank you both for a few Miklos and Laurence for the well moderation. Thank you for all the panelists for the great presentation. I did think it was timely to do that because there were a lot of interest. I just apologize. We had a technical issue and maximum white people could connect at the same time. We had 419 people registered. So we really apologize for the people that have not been able to join. Of course, the um, event is recorded. The presentation will be shared. And um, what so I think is good, Laurent and Miklos, we should think also at the one time this year to have a physical meeting. To yes. Allow some chat. Uh, we, need to fit, we need to fit 400 people. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's, the, it's the webinar with the biggest attendance, and I think it's not by hazard because today is the World United Nations World Creativity and Innovation Day, and here what we saw it is really create creativity and innovation uh, in drilling, and, and, and not only the last speaker raised a lot of interest in exploration, which uh, is followed usually by drilling, and then and, and really I'm really thrilled of this uh, of this interest of of the topic. Indeed. And so what I can just remind you is that soon we will have a market report and you will have so further data and, and view on what are the, the trends in the market where these technologies for drilling are used also to developing projects. Thank you all. With that, we can close, I think, this really interesting webinar. I thank you all for attending, panelists and moderators for managing it. And I wish you a good end of the day. I hope to thank see you, you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Thank bye -bye. you very bye -bye. much to everyone. Bye.